I'm really heartened to know of the great deal of optimism that still exists in this room, um, you know, from the, the straw poll. And uh, let's hope that we can continue to maintain that, that, that perpetual optimism about all of us. Now, geopolitical tensions, including the war in Ukraine, protracted supply chain disruptions have led to strong and persistent inflationary pressures. These have in turn, result, these have in turn, in turn resulted in synchronised monetary policy tightening all around the world. There is likely to be, this is likely to cause a pullback in consumption, investment spending, thus dampening growth in major economies such as the US. Any further escalations in the Russian-Ukraine conflict could lead to further rise in food and energy prices and exacerbate already high global inflationary pressures. The World Bank has projected a slowdown in China's GDP growth in 2022 due to its COVID-0 policy, together with the property market downturn. And this has actually put China's growth behind the rest of Asia-Pacific region for the first time in more than three decades. Now, given these headwinds, the International Monetary Fund, or the IMF, has characterised the global economic outlook as gloomy and uncertain. Just last month, OPEC has cut its 2022 forecast for growth in world oil demand and has trimmed next year's figures. The International Energy Agency said that this would further drive up prices and could push the global economy into recession. What does this environment mean for us here in Singapore? MTI has announced that based on advanced estimates, the Singapore economy grew by 4.4% year-on-year in Q3, the third quarter of 2022. And this is easing slightly from the 4.5% growth in the previous quarter. On a quarter-on-quarter -quarter seasonally adjusted basis, the economy expanded by 1.5%. And this is a turnaround from the 0.2% contraction in the preceding quarter. Barring the materialisation of downside risks, the Singapore economy remains on track to expand by 3% to 4% for the whole year for 2022. Singapore's GDP growth in 2023 is expected to remain positive, but moderate from 2022's level, ostensibly due to the projected slowdown in the global economy. And should the major economies slow down even more sharply than expected, the slowdown in our economy would be more significant than anticipated. So we will continue to monitor the situation very, very closely. And that's how we see the immediate challenges before us, as well as the global economy. But even as we tackle these challenges, we must also set our sights further, further to seize opportunities to secure the future of Asia for ourselves. I would like to highlight and share with you three key areas which I think will define our longer-term growth. First, the growth potential of Asia. Asia as a region has shown much resilience during the pandemic. During the global pandemic, Asia has contracted less compared to the world's economy. Asia is also expected to rebound faster. Asian countries are expected to be amongst the world's fastest growing economies, given the rise of the middle class demand. Currently, the region already makes up more than half of the world's middle class population, and this will continue to grow rapidly over the next decade. This means that the bulk of the world's consumer demand will soon pivot towards Asia, turning the region into an engine of growth for the global economy. Our immediate region in Southeast Asia is a shining bright spot with many growth areas that serve as opportunities for Singapore as well as the entire region. With a combined population that is larger than the EU and sound economic fundamentals, working 
collaboratively together will allow us to collectively seize the opportunities afforded by the current world order. The region's potential is immense and we need to partner with one another to capture these opportunities very quickly. Second, climate change. Climate change is the defining challenge of our time. With many low-lying coastal cities exposed to floods and typhoon risks, expected increases in heat and humidity across the region and anticipated drought in some areas and extreme precipitation in others, Asia is one of the region's most vulnerable to climate change globally. In 2021 alone, over 57 million people were affected by climate disasters in this region. These challenges also mean that there are tremendous mitigation and adaptation opportunities here in Asia. Investments in clean, clean energy, energy and, and enhancements, enhancements to infrastructure to support the deployment of renewables and new energy technologies will be pivotal to mitigate the impact of climate change. Investors are increasingly accounting for climate risks as well as the environmental social and governance factors in their decision-making. Economies and businesses which are early in the game in shifting towards low-carbon and sustainable solutions will have not just a clear competitive advantage but also first-mover advantages. International cooperation will be key to co-develop renewable energy sources and low-carbon solutions, facilitate cross-border electricity trading and electricity markets collaborations. And this is where we will need to work closely as a region to achieve mutually beneficial, mutually win-win-win outcomes for all. Since June this year, Singapore has started importing renewable energy from Laos through Thailand and Malaysia using existing grid interconnections. This is made possible because of the collaboration of partners across different countries supported by the governments of four ASEAN member states. This is a major milestone and it is a significant big step forward. We hope that this can serve as a pathfinder towards realising the broader ASEAN power grid vision. Having a regional power grid will be beneficial for the region. Not only will it help to unlock the region's renewable energy potential, it also has the potential to catalyse economic growth by, stimulate, by stimulating clean energy investment flows, generating new clean jobs across all of these ASEAN economies. That, ladies and gentlemen, is digitalisation. Digitalisation which has been accelerated by this COVID-19 pandemic. Digital trade and the digital economy will continue to play an increasingly important role in our economies. As we saw the acceleration of digital adoption by both businesses and consumers during the pandemic globally, as well as in Asia. It has transformed consumer behaviours, business models, and it has created new opportunities as well as markets. Indonesia, for instance, saw 21 million new digital consumers Customers, since the start of the pandemic, 72% 72, 72 of them were actually from non-metro areas. Its digital economy is now sized at 70 billion US dollars and is expected to grow at a CAGR or compounded annual growth rate of 20% to 146 billion US dollars by 2025, just under three years away. The outlook for Southeast Asian digital economy is on track to exceed 363 billion US dollars, which will become one of the world's fastest growing digital markets with opportunity in areas such as e-commerce, cloud services, fintech and payment solutions for cross-border online consumption as well as in food delivery. Digital technologies such as AI, the Metaverse and Web 3.0, which are more nascent, will also have the potential for businesses to ride on new growth opportunities to create certainty for businesses. Singapore has also pioneered a network of digital economy agreements or DEAs with partners including Chile, 
New Zealand and Australia. The DEAs seek to establish international rules, frameworks and standards to foster interoperability and to facilitate seamless digital trade in areas like invoicing and payments, as well as to ensure and to enable the free flow of data underpinning the digital economy. All these developments, ladies and gentlemen, will mean more opportunities, easier access for startups and companies around the world to tap on the strong market potential of Asia, harnessing the rising middle class demand that I mentioned earlier. So, what do all these developments mean for Singapore? How do we navigate the uncertainties and how do we capture and seize these new opportunities for our advantage? I'm an optimist at heart. I have every confidence that Singapore will be able to overcome the short-term challenges and continue to make good, sustainable living and livelihoods for our people. In fact, we are moving, we are growing from a position of strength with strong fundamentals. Last year, despite the challenges posed by COVID, we managed to enhance our reputation as a reliable and trusted hub for businesses and investments. EDB met its medium to long-term goal to secure investment commitments amounting to 11.8 billion Singapore dollars in fixed asset investments and 5.2 billion Singapore dollars in total business expenditure per annum. Approximately 17,000 jobs will be created when these projects are realised. This is testament to our strategic location and connectivity, our rule of law, good governance frameworks and a highly skilled, talented and educated workforce. However, these factors alone do not guarantee our continued success in the future. To remain relevant and to be firmly anchored as a key note to Asia and the world, we must continue to refresh our economic strategies. We must continue to stay open and to continue to invest significantly in our people. Allow me to share what I mean for these three broad thrusts. First, we must constantly keep an eye on the future. We must constantly think and reinvent for the long term how we can continue to grow sustainably. To this end, we have set out our economic strategies for the decade ahead under the Singapore Economy 2030 vision. This vision outlines our ambition, the direction and the strategies across the key pillars of manufacturing, services, trade and enterprises. Together, the, these efforts will put our industries, our enterprises and our workers on a firmer footing for long-term sustainable growth. To remain competitive and to anchor ourselves as a global hub, we must continue to attract the best companies and top talent to Singapore so that we can ensure dynamism and innovation in our economy. Our foreign work pass moves, such as the introduction of the Overseas Network and Expertise or ONE pass from next year will reinforce our global competitiveness. This will in turn help us create more opportunities for Singaporeans at every level of the workforce. We have also committed to invest in infrastructure to expand our air and our sea cargo capabilities. The first berths at Tuas Port are now operational. By its targeted completion sometime in the 2040s, it will be the world's largest fully automated port, almost doubling today's volumes. We've also announced the resumption of development for Changi Airport Terminal 5. This will cater for air traffic growth and expand our air cargo handling capacities to 5.4 million tonnes per annum. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, Changi Airport Terminal 5 will be as large as Changi Airport Terminals 1, 2 and 3 combined. In addition, we have developed plans for the air cargo hub at Changi to be faster, to be smarter and to be greener with the use of data and technology. Second, we will maintain our long-standing commitment 
to open and free trade, and multilateral cooperation to keep our doors open to investors, to ideas, and to talent. Against the backdrop of heightened geopolitical tensions, it is even more important to ensure greater integration and cooperation with our partners in Asia and the world. We will need to continue our support for multilateral institutions like the World Trade Organization, the IMF, the International Energy Agency and the World Bank. These organizations continue to drive globalization and multilateral cooperation to address a wide range of global issues, ranging from climate change to food security, which impact all of us in the region. We will continue to deepen our connectivity with the rest of the world through regional free trade agreements, such as the RCEP, or Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, and the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, or CPTPP. The US has also signaled its commitment to strengthening its engagement of Asia, including through the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, or IPAF. The IPAF is a forward-looking initiative intended to go beyond traditional trade rules to address new and emerging economic issues. These include areas that resonate strongly in the region, such as in digital and green economies and supply chain resilience. Third, we will invest and develop our people. This will allow our fellow Singaporeans to excel and to succeed in the careers and their aspirations that they choose to embark on. We will invest in skills training and career health for our people, developing more Singaporean specialists and leaders across all sectors of our economy. We will work with our tripartite partners to build fairer and more supportive workplaces with the upcoming workplace fairness legislation. Some Singaporeans wonder if these moves collectively will be enough to prevent excessive competition, widening skills gaps, and rising inequalities. Many of them also wonder whether we are doing enough to ensure that we do not leave certain segments of the population behind. Through the Forward Singapore exercise, we will engage Singaporeans on these issues so that collectively we can have a better idea of where we are today where we want to be in the future and how we can get there. We, continue, we have been and we will continue to assure Singaporeans that we will walk, travel and shape this journey together. Government, community, businesses, all together. No one Singaporean will have to walk this path alone. In particular, the Empower Pillar on Economy and Jobs seeks to chart out the roadmap to create a brighter future for Singaporeans amidst an open economic environment of churn and competition. All of our moves, ladies and gentlemen, act in concert to equip, to empower and to assure Singaporeans and businesses to create collectively the best chance for us to do well and to seize the opportunities ahead. To conclude, by constantly refreshing our economic strategies, by staying open, by continually investing in our people, I'm confident that we can create a vibrant global city and a society of opportunities for Singaporeans now and in the many, many years to come. As I know, and I know that this is the case also for Asia, every country will want to build on their strengths to put themselves in the best position to capture the opportunities ahead. The intense competition for talent regionally and globally, such as the introduction of the High Potential Individual Visa Scheme by the UK, the Top Talent Pass Scheme by Hong Kong recently, demonstrates very clearly to us that every economy is upping their ante and stepping up their game. As these as their economies and people benefit from the growth, so will Asia collectively as a whole. And this is why it underscores my optimism 
for the future of Asia. You said that you're an optimist at heart, and I think it's a sentiment that you share with most of the audience here. But on the other hand, we've also heard of the IMF, for example, warning of risk to the global economy um, and you know, slowing uh, down globally you know, from a trifecta, for example, um, the ongoing war, the inflationary hikes, and of course, the stalling growth in the three largest economies, the US, China, and Euro area. So on balance, do you share this gloomy prognosis? The discussions that went earlier was also quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I shared, uh, as I sort of shared earlier on about the, the straw poll, um, the, the level of optimism in this room is, is actually um, quite pervasive. As I've also shared in my speech earlier on, um, we have eased slightly in this quarter, in the third quarter, from 4.5% uh, to 4.4%. Barring any um, increased shocks, next year we do expect some slowdown. Um, at, the, at this particular point in time, um, a bit early for us to, to comment on whether we will go into a, a technical recession. Uh, some slowdown is, is expected. But having said that, we are um, quite a well-diversified economy. Um, from inward-facing professional services, um, consultancy services, financial services, um, generally the services sector, um, with the lifting of the uh, restrictions, we've seen a significant uplift. Um, so you can see that tourism, uh, air travel, hospitality services, F&B, have actually seen a significant uptick, including uh, professional services for people flying in to provide consultancy services and, and our own local skilled talent flying out. So we think that that should continue to, to lift up. Having said that, manufacturing, and we are an export-driven uh, manufacturing sector, the value add pertaining to the semiconductor, which is a significant component of our manufacturing industry, we think in the months ahead, we'll face some headwinds. So all in, because of the, the way our economy is di di has been diversified, I think that um, it should still be in, in relatively steady shape. We're watching it very closely in terms of uh, the geopolitical tensions that could result either in the form of an escalation to accidental kind of uh, um, skirmishes um, or an escalation of the Russian-Ukraine crisis. Um, a, a dis proportionate, um, outsized, um, uh, disordered market reaction to further tightening um, of, of fiscal policies by different governments or, or, or interest rates. Um, these are things that can throw our projections off the track. At this particular point in time, it does appear that um, from now to the end of the year, we should still come in at between 3 to 4% um, of growth. Next year, it should moderate, it should ease off a bit more. Um, but I'm still, compared to the, the, the gloom that is pervading across Europe uh, and other developed economies, I think we still have quite uh, some legs left in terms of our economy to, to continue along. And you mentioned this ordered reactions you know, um, around the world. Do you think that the bright spots which you mentioned, right, including the services sector, will actually hold up? There has been a significant uh, amount of pent-up demand um, as a result of the border restrictions. As a result of our lifting in, of, of these restrictions in April, we've seen a significant uptick um, in terms of um, our hospitality, um, services, food and beverage, and, and also air travel. I think that this will continue. Um, we have also seen that um, Notwithstanding, we, we, we uh, had an uptick in terms of the number of COVID cases over the last one month or so. Uh, that wave seems to be coming down. Uh, with the year-end holidays coming, I'm quite sure everyone in this room 
will find difficulty booking tickets, coming into Singapore and also leaving Singapore, getting reservations. There is, uh, as Manpower Minister, I'm very, very cognizant and very sensitive to the fact that uh, there's significant requests for, for increase in manpower work passes for, for FMB, for hospitality services. So I think that part of it will continue to, to ramp up. For the manufacturing part, the petrochemicals, a lot of that export is into China. Um, the continued controls in terms of how they have implemented, uh, centered around the zero COVID policy, the property slowdown, that would have some impact. But all in, because of the pivots, moving into um, AI, moving into uh, a lot more of the deep tech and IoT, I think we are still in a relatively steady state. And I was thinking about the word empower, um, to empower both businesses but also workers. And one of the big moves which you mentioned, uh, which you announced this year, was the One Pass or the ONE Pass. Obviously, I mean, we all know the reasons for it, but there has been already a lot of debate about whether it will shut out Singaporeans from top jobs. Given the difficult climate that we're seeing right now, and given the slight uptick in unemployment and retrenchments, you know, based on the Manpower Ministry's latest figures, how would you recommend that we strike that balance between assuaging citizens' concerns, anxieties over job availability, and staying open and competitive? That's a great um, point. The, at the center, at the core of all of our manpower policy, our singular focus is on our people. Everyone here uh, would agree with me that, um, that at the center of any economy, any country's attractiveness must lie with the talent, the education, the skill set, the ability of, the, of its people. So everything that we do centers on that because in Singapore, given our lack of, of any form of natural resource, people People are our only resource. That's all we have. When we went out there to look at how do we continue to build, to sustain our razor-sharp competitive advantage, how do we continue to, to stay abreast of change? And by the way, change is not a constant. Change is accelerating. Disruptive change is also accelerating at a very, very rapid pace. So for us to keep up with that accelerating pace, it is therefore important for us to also ensure that we keep the level of workforce always at a level that we can compete globally, not just regionally, but globally. And when we look at the overseas network, the expertise that's needed, in many of the, the areas, digital, fintech, even in, in, in uh, the green economy, uh, sustainability, going into renewables, hydrogen, for instance, low carbon emission research. These are areas that would require us to not just develop the local workforce, but also plug the gaps by bringing the best from all over the world to come and help us and complement our local talent. And it becomes a, contemp uh, a sort of a, a simultaneous strategy. So contemporaneously, while you train, you need to also plug the gaps that exist today. And by bringing in these people with that kind of talent, it allows us a more accelerated pace of that development. So if you look at how we set the benchmark. We look at the universe of uh, both local Singaporean talent as well as the foreign work pass um, working and we use the benchmark of 30,000 a month as a, as a benchmark. That's, by the way, only one proxy. We look at a lot of other indicators as well and in time to come, 
uh, my ministry will, will share more in, 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 in due course. But when we look at, at that, that top sliver, we realize that about 7,000 of our long-term work pass holders here already qualify. And we have a significantly higher number of Singaporeans who are also in that ballpark range. So we are very comforted by the fact that our Singaporeans and our country, we do possess the same level of top talent in our country. But for us to really grow the pie significant, uh, significantly, we will need, in order for us to transcend the, the constraints that we have as a, as, a, as, a, as a limited size, we need to bring in all of these global businesses, opportunities that can abound, that we can create for even more Singaporeans to eventually be able to, to move up to these jobs as well. And that is really the impetus for the creation of this path. We have the level of capabilities and the skill sets. We always sort of talk about how knowledge is good. A good friend is always uh, sort of impressed upon myself and I think some of the leaders here would agree with me. We have knowledge, we have know-how. But there are many opportunities out there that know who is going to be the, the, the final bridge that would nail it. So that's why when we talk about this one pass, overseas networks and expertise, is the networking that we also want to be able to establish for our Singaporean top talent as well. So hence, developing locally the knowledge, upskilling, reskilling them, giving them the know-how, right? The last part is establishing the international network, developing the know-who. But speaking of growing pies and networking, do you honestly think that there is a large enough pie in Asia, the region and in Singapore to go around? The pie is large enough. It's not a zero-sum game. It's an ecosystem that, that ultimately builds on itself and creates a virtuous cycle. As I've shared, in Singapore, people are our only resource. By creating an ecosystem whereby solid, growing businesses anchor here, they attract the best talent both locally to be developed and internationally to come here, that further attracts even more businesses to be anchored here. It creates that, that business cycle, that cycle that is positively reinforcing and growing. And as a result of that, we become, we aim to become a magnet where we can attract top talent, top businesses to anchor here. That gives us a very good runway. That helps us to build a much broader and deeper middle segment. The benefits of it percolate downwards and in all economies, in all of the hard work, in all of the, the brilliance, the competence and capabilities, there's also an element in, in business school, they call it variance. Actually, it's just called luck. Sometimes, as a result of luck, people sort of fall by the, they slip through the cracks and they fall by the roadside. But it's only when you have that ecosystem that you've created with all the top businesses anchored here with the top talent and building that huge middle segment as, as, your, as your buffers, then you have enough economic resources to carry those that are hit by this negative variance, the, the, the relatively the bad luck, so to speak, that we can carry them along. And that will hopefully go a longer way in terms of renewing, refreshing, and improving our social compact. I like your observation about broadening the middle and holding that thought, perhaps we can turn to questions from the audience via pigeonhole. Um, I think there's one question on 
competition for top talent. Since we are on the subject of talent in the broader middle, um, what about top talent? How is Singapore faring, in your opinion? We are always hungry for more top talent. This is a race. Whether we like it or we don't, we are a very small country. It's like a treadmill. The moment you stop, you actually fall behind. So in our pursuit, we can never stop. And depending on, on, on which level you are at, there are times when the gradient gets higher or the speed gets faster. So I think to the point about where we are today, I think the moment we think we have arrived, we, have, we would have actually be we will actually be falling behind. Yeah, one more question on that talent, that broad middle, or even the bottom. You know, um, what do you think of the people who may fall between the cracks and get left behind? Is there that risk of a, a dual economy forming? We try to constantly through forward SG. Um, and, and it's not just uh, Ford SG. If you look at what has happened in the past many decades since our independence, we've engaged in multiple national conversations. There was the emerging stronger conversation. Um, I think the most recent was the, the one on, on women conversation in, in terms of women development. Um, and now moving on into Ford SG. I think by getting all of our countrymen, our country women, involved in these national conversations. And we have a whole series of them. Every fortnight, uh, a different political office holder will go to a different um, constituency or, or GRC to talk and understand. And we engage as wide, um, a, dis as wide as a diaspora of residents, constituents, um, different interest groups as possible to get feedback. And that's how we continue to build, get feedback, get opinions, and build consensus and understand to the extent which policies can work much faster, much better. All policies, when at the point of origination, always have good intention. We always want to achieve what we think is in the best interest of our people. But along the way, we need to continue to tweak them, to tailor them, to nuance it. And that is really the, the, the these forward SG conversations is what it's supposed to bring about to help us to calibrate some of these policies. With that, as we continue to refresh our social co uh, compact, this dual um, sort of uh, uh, nature kind of um, problem that you have uh, highlighted, we hope to be able to mitigate it completely. Even if you are not able to completely mitigate it, at least to minimize it. So that, like I said, we have enough of our social schemes to help those that are left behind and carry them along with us. And um, okay, moving on to the next cluster of questions about energy. So someone asked, how could Singapore become more self-reliant when it comes to food and energy? And the second question is, is the government going to help businesses and consumers install renewable energy? Solar power panels? Thank you. I, I, I cover uh, uh, energy as well my portfolio in, uh, uh, as the second minister for MCI. And th this is... Uh, a point that's very close to heart. Now, for I think for the benefit of, of um, uh, everyone here, for our energy security, our energy as we transition towards uh, a low carbon future, we have also revised our uh, carbon emission targets. We are reliant on what we call the four switches. The first switch that we have um, is our reliance in terms of uh, burning fossilized fuels for the generation of our electricity. Now, I know that people will say that why are we still burning these fossilized fuels? We have opted to go for natural gas. They are the least, it is the least polluting of all of the fossilized fuels compared to coal, diesel, uh, and, 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 and what have not. 
fossilized fuels produces the least amount of carbon dioxide emission. So it's the least polluting of all of the fossilized fuels. So today, the main backbone of where uh, we get our electricity from is from the generation companies. They are located all over the island. And the, the source of fuel is natural gas. So that sort of provides for about 94, 95% of all of our electricity needs today. The second switch is on renewable energy. And we have actively been rolling out um, all measures of programs, grants, to get our companies, our factories to pivot and change and install solar panels. We have also funded research into very, very uh, uh, advanced type of uh, solar, solar voltage, photovoltaic cells um, to improve the efficiency of the capturing of solar energy so that they can be converted into electricity. However, we are also mindful of the fact that uh, notwithstanding that we are one degree north of the equator, we also have very high cloud cover. And uh, until I, I became a, a minister in the trade and uh, industry, I covered energy as a portfolio, I didn't realize that we also have the highest incidence of the number of thunderstorms on any given year. So my, my last uh, sort of count was, I think we have more than 200 days of thunderstorms in a year. And if you consider the fact there are 365 days in a year with 200 over days of thunderstorms, you can imagine that uh, the amount of intermittent, right, when, when the storms come about, is actually quite high. Having said that, I don't know whether you're aware that we are already one of the most solar dense country in the world. In terms of the, the, the application of solar panels, we are already one of the most solar dense countries in the world. And even if we are able to get on, which is our target, we get on to cover every single public building, HDB, JTC, all our flat, flatted flexi. We can, our canals, our waterways, some of our, our open uh, air spaces and so on, we probably can just provide about 5 to 6%. So if I cover everyone, uh, you know, here, with, with solar panels, we are only, only, you know, the max that we can generate is about 5 to 6% of our overall consumption. So we obviously have to move on to other things, which is why the next thing is on the ASEAN regional power grid. So the third switch has to be imports from the region. So we piloted that to the LTMS grid. We have signed MOUs with Vietnam, with Cambodia, with Lao PDR. We are looking further afield um, for countries around the region so that we can all work on building this ASEAN regional grid that we can tap renewable energy from our neighboring countries. So that's the third switch. The fourth switch is investing significantly. DPM Wong, just last Monday at the opening of the SEAL, our Singapore International Energy Week, announced our national hydrogen strategy. Also, revise upwards, uh, more ambitious zero uh, emission targets. So by 2050, um, you know, of course, we're serving caveats. By 2050, we will have, we will reach net zero. So we have all these four switches. But I want to underscore the point. At the end of the day, conservation has to be key. So for us, while we transition towards hydrogen, while we transition towards a low carbon future, today the cleanest transition fuel is still natural gas. Hence, you will see that I will be consistently making the point and impressing on the fact that for us, in order for us to remain secure, for us to remain resilient, we must continue to be able to have access to carriers of whether it is natural gas or to carry hydrogen in the form of ammonia or other organic carbon carriers. So that sort of pretty much sums up. For food, we have a 30-30 vision. 
We are also ramping up the development of the uh, agri-food um, and industry park, going into vertical hydroponics. We are looking at ways to grow our own greens. We are looking at plant-based proteins. And significant research has been invested in, but I think that is a conversation for another day with uh, Minister Grace Fu. So, everything is on an accelerated pace. And obviously, if I may uh, add an exhortation here, we have only about 30 over 1,000 babies that are born every year. And you can imagine, we need doctors, we need computer engineers, we need lawyers, we need very good journalists like yourself and, and the colleagues here. We simply, even though we, we have been able to significantly develop and train our talent, but for our aspirations, it's just not enough. And hence, we need to constantly go out there and bring in top talent to complement and plug the openings that we have in our local ecosystem. Well, um, we have time for maybe one or two last questions. Um, I feel obliged to go back to the question of talent because another question came in. And this one's about the silver tsunami that's going to hit Singapore. And I thought, you know, we might want to listen from you about what you think of how we can maximise our limited resources, including over Singaporeans. In about a couple of years, I, I will be reaching that, that, that same uh, age group. Uh, and some of us here as well. Many of my old friends are, are, are here as well. With the great amount of um, institutional knowledge, experiential wisdom, one of the, the, the key strategy that we have in manpower is to continue to prolong productive aging. And really, age is a number. So we should not be constrained or limited by uh, a number that is at 62 or 63. Hence, you find that today, the retirement age, this year, we raise it to 63. And we have a five-year re-employment age, which you retire at, 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 at 63, the company is obliged to offer you re-employment until 68, five years post your retirement. If companies do not offer you um, a re-employment opportunity, then some form of a retirement benefits has to be paid out. The plan is to continue to raise this retirement age to 65, and therefore the re-employment age to 70, by the end of this decade. Now, at retirement, it doesn't mean that the company is obliged to give you the same role at the same pay. The, the company can negotiate with you for some other role, perhaps less stressful and you know, with, a, with, a, with a, a slight easing in terms of responsibility, KPIs, burden, and of course, correspondingly, um, uh, uh, with some form of pay adjustment, right? So, MOM can have details. If you want to find out more, we're happy to share them with you. At the same time, at the same time, flexible work arrangement, increasing workplace welfare, um, building a nice social environment would be the way to go because ostensibly with a green workforce, we can tap into their experiences, their institutional knowledge, the experiential wisdom, but they may not want to, to, to work at the same level. So what MOM will do is to continue to roll out and encourage, provide incentives for more flexible work arrangements. At the same time, also create some form of a matching platform for companies to tap into them either on a consultancy basis or uh, on, a, on a project kind of basis itself. And with that, we can then leverage into different pockets of excellence within what we have. So those are some very broad um, ticket measures that we have planned for. There will be other announcements coming ahead I think it's probably beyond the scope of today's discussion for me to announce all of this, but I think you can keep yourself, uh, keep our eyes peeled on, on 
on the subsequent announcement in the months ahead. Looking forward to that. Um, and just to wrap up, maybe just uh, some final quick thoughts on how Singapore and ASEAN and Asia can work together to maximise opportunities since today's forum is about Asia. I was at a, a, a forum in, um, um, in Pittsburgh. We're talking about clean energy. And um, indeed, there is a sense of gloom over what's happening in, uh, in Europe with the crisis. So Dr. Fateh Biro, who's the executive director of, of um, um, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, was commenting on the fact that spring will come again. So we should not let this gloom affect our longer term plan in terms of transition towards a low carbon future to deal with the impact of global warming and climate. So on the sidelines of, the, of, the, of, of a meeting that I had with him, I, I was sharing with him, actually in Southeast Asia, because he said spring will come. So I said that in Southeast Asia, we are already in spring. We have stability. We have a growing middle class segment. We've got very good working partnerships with our ASEAN neighbours, uh, uh, you know, he just gave us a speech about Mati earlier on. We have very good ties with uh, working relationship with Indonesia, um, with Malaysia, with many of our ASEAN member states. So spring is already here. We don't have to wait for spring. It's for us to work collaboratively, positively, optimistically together and bring us into summer. And that, I hope, is what I can leave with all of you as a result of this forum today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, from spring to summer, and on the optimistic note, thank you very much, Minister, for sharing your thoughts with us today. Thank you.